All right, um, let's get everything started. Hi, so my name is Parth. I work at August Home, and today I am delighted to be discussing how to write your first custom operator. So first of all, uh, I work at a company called August Home. We make Bluetooth smart locks and other smart home access hardware. Um, it's a really fun company. We're based in San Francisco, and last year we announced the ability to detect whether or not your door is open or closed using one of our smart locks, which actually not many other people on the market can say that they do. Uh, I actually wrote that, that animation, which is one of the reasons why I'm showing that slide also, because I just think it's really pretty. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, quick housekeeping. There's a lot of Kotlin in Android world, uh, but I'm going to run an old school today. Uh, there won't be any Kotlin in my presentation, mostly because I think that Java is still easier to scan for most people, and since we're going to be going through a fair amount of code, I want to make sure that you don't have to sit there and like parse, okay, what does this mean? Let's convert it to Java in my head, all of that. It will just, it'll just be Java from the, from the get-go. Um, the other thing is, uh, this is the only slide that you will see emojis on, and that's, that's my promise to you. All right, whether you like emojis or not, that's the way it's going to be. So. Here's our roadmap, uh, no scope creep allowed. We'll talk about Rx a little bit, then we'll go into the anatomy of custom operators. We'll have two examples, and we'll go over some, not anti-patterns, but not suggested ways to do things. And then finally, we'll open it up for some questions. We can have questions about my stuff, we can have a philosophical discussion about Rx Java, whatever, whatever makes you happy. All right, so first of all, we're gonna like just have a quick overview of RxJava. I don't think there's anything here that's going to blow your minds if you already know RxJava, or maybe it will, who knows. Uh, mostly this is going to be a discussion about back pressure. So RxJava is asynchronous if you want it to be. It's an event-based stream, meaning that you get events for subscription, completion, error, all of that. It's composable, meaning that you can do functional composition, f of g of x, you know, currying, anything like that. And finally, it's back pressure sensitive. Uh, and that's the, that's the part of RxJava that like, is arguably some of the most powerful features, but it's also you know, maybe not something that applies to a lot of Android developers. We'll talk about that more in a second. Um, just a formal definition of back pressure, it's when an upstream emits faster than the downstream can consume. Uh, and to avoid overwhelming downstream operators, uh, the upstream can wait to push data down until the slower downstream operators request it. So it's a pull model, not a push model. And that's different than all the other operators, so that flowable versus observable, single, maybe completable, all the rest of them. So back pressure can happen in a couple different situations. It can happen if your producer is very fast. Um, so like if you have a large number of emissions or if it happens really, really quickly, or if most of the times the, the producer uh, operates normally, but you just get hammered with data sometimes. Like uh, if, you're, you know, if your user is drawing a signature on the screen, most of the times that signature isn't going to be that much. But if someone just like, you know, goes like this a bunch, you're going to get a lot of data. Um, or if you have multiple mismatch sources is the other big one. So let's say you have two infinite streams, and one of them emits twice as fast as the other one, and then you zip those streams together, eventually you're going to run out of memory, and that's going to cause back pressure. The other thing that happens is the consumer is slow to consume the data for some reason. Consumption is expensive. Maybe you're doing like some crazy algorithms, uh, and that, that causes the, the slowness. Uh, the other is plain old standard blocking operations need to happen, whether that's file, whether that's carrier pigeon, whether that's network, whatever. Uh, all of these can cause back pressure. And now you're probably wondering, do I really care about back pressure? The answer is probably not, but I don't know your life specifically. Um, here's my experience. I've been using RxJava in production since 2015, and I've encountered back pressure in, in, in my code one time. Um, I was trying to update a progress bar with every byte that was downloaded off of the network. Uh, the video was 80 megabytes, so that's 80 times 1024, which is around 81,000 updates to the UI thread, uh, and that just blew, blew everything away. So the solution is not to like construct something crazy with RxJava, but to just not try to update the UI thread 81,000 times over the course of like five seconds. 
Um, that being said, it's not that you shouldn't know about back pressure, you should be aware of it, but realize that in most standard applications, you're not dealing with the volume of data that requires an intricate understanding of back pressure versus like if you're writing one of Netflix's servers or something and you're just getting so much information, you need to be able to push against all of that information that's coming in. All right, now for the interesting part. We're gonna talk about how to do some interesting things using RxJava. So a custom operator is actually not that scary. I don't know if any of you have looked inside the RxJava sources, but there's not that much going on for the basic operators. We've got a constructor. We've got subscribe actual, which is what happens at the time of subscription when you call dot subscribe. And we have an inner listener. Uh, and we have two kinds of inner listeners. The first kind of inner listener is a bridge. So if you want to you know, turn a click listener into a reactive stream, or if you have like some blocking file I.O. that you want to know when it's done or you know, be updated for each part of the I.O. or something like that. Uh, the other one is an intermediate operator. So if you want to um, have some custom logic that happens, maybe you want to do um, you want to do a, a very special kind of repeat or a very special kind of retry, that would be when you implement the observer interface. And we'll talk about both of these. But first, we're going to talk about the, in my opinion, the more common use case, which is to bridge from the non-reactive world to the reactive world. So this is the code from the title slide. Um, and if you look at that, that's a custom operator. We, uh, we're going we're gonna to make a click operator. Let's take a look inside. So here's our skeleton of the outer class. Uh, you'll notice that this extends observable, so we can treat it like any other observable, whether you call it observable.create, which we'll talk about in a, in a little bit, whether you call like observable.just, you can treat this the exact same way to all callers of this code. Uh, we have a constructor which isn't that interesting. Maybe this, this particular slide would have been easier in Kotlin, but other than that, you know. Uh, and we have the subscribe actual block. Uh, this, is what's, th this is your callback for when the person actually calls subscribe. Um, we have this class listener that is the actual inner, inner listener for both the on click and, the, um, and, the RX, and handles the RX Java code it's, it, inside it as well. Um, we'll see more on that in a moment, but notably we have observer.onsubscribe and that takes a disposable instance. This is how downstream operators can cancel and cause our code to dispose itself when necessary. So this is your, this is your callback to clean up. Um, notice here that we set the on-click listener in the subscription. Uh, and this is important because let's say you, um, let's say you subscribe to the, you know, you, you create a click observable and, or you create multiple click observables for the same view and you subscribe to them. Well, what's going to happen is there's still only one view under the hood, right? They all point to the same view instance, and you're going you're gonna to clobber your own click listener, uh, just like you would if you called view.setClickListener1, you know, view.setClickListener2. It would be the same thing. So regardless of what you're doing, you have to understand how the underlying system works. That applies to RxJava, that applies to Android, that applies to Java. Uh, enough about that. Let's check about the inner listener. So as you can see, we have something that implements on click listener, and we have something that extends the main thread disposable um, class. Main thread disposable is an internal, uh, an internal API to RxJava, but it's, it's pretty stable. I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, it basically just ensures that the subscription occurs on the main thread, uh, which is a good idea when you're dealing with views. If you're not dealing with views, then you don't necessarily have to uh, subscribe on the main thread. But, we have our constructor, which is the most boring thing in the history of humankind, so we're not going to go over that. Um, but we have onClick. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. If we haven't been disposed, then we'll fire, we'll fire the, the click listener, or we'll fire the observer, which is our downstream. Um, now, if you've read the source code to Rx binding and been like, oh, I wonder how Jake Wharton makes his click listeners, it's pretty similar to this, honestly. The difference is that I'm sending boolean.true as opposed to creating a new object, just because boolean.true is a ready-made singleton. I just think it's nicer and a little more clean that way. You can do whatever makes you happy. Um, the if disposed isn't strictly necessary, but in a lot of situations where users are clicking buttons or interacting with views, oftentimes this can occur near the boundary of when there's a configuration change. And this basically ensures that if there's a configuration change or something that causes the, the, um, the activity to become invalidated, uh, you're not going to be sending click events 
near that near that boundary. If it's been disposed, we're just gonna we're just gonna shut off the stream. And finally, we have the on dispose, which is going to be passed in from the subscribe from the observer dot on subscribe as we saw earlier. Um, it's pretty easy. We just nail out the click listener. Um, we might not even have to do anything. You might be asking, well, why do we need to null out the click listener? I don't have to null out click listeners inside my activity or fragment. And that's because, the, the, the reason why is because we have an instance of the listener being passed in. And the last thing we'd want is that listener to hold on to a copy of the view, the view to hold on a copy of the listener, and everything just kind of stays in memory forever. You just shipped a memory leak. Uh, depending on who you talk to, this might be overkill. Some people think that depending on the operating system, the GC will kick in, detect the cyclic reference, and just blow everything away for you. But I don't know if you want to be the person who ships a memory leak because I thought the GC would handle it. It's better to just handle it yourself. No problems. Uh, this, you don't have to just wrap you know, primitives downstream. You, can, uh, you don't have to send only primitive downstream. You can send objects downstream as well. Uh, this is an example of how to send multiple different event types within the same wrapper. So you create a seek bar event, and you can tell the person when the, project, when the progress changed, sorry, or when the person stopped touching, or any, any number of events. You can use enums. You can use instance of. Um, don't use instance of, this is not a good idea, but definitely use enums or in def or string def or whatever. All right, so that actually, that actually wasn't too bad. That was, that was a custom operator, and um, it's, something, it's, it's, a, it's a template that can be applied to a lot of different use cases where you're, where you're trying to uh, extend a custom operator, or where you're trying to extend from the non-reactive world to the reactive world. Um, now, let's go over a little more interesting example, which is implementing the observer interface when we're trying to build an in-between or intermediate operator in the middle of a stream. And for that, we're going to do a combination of map versus filter. So basically, you have one operator that does both the map or the filter and then the map operation. Uh, notice here that we, it's, a, it's a generic operator. It takes, uh, it takes two generic parameters, in and out. You could use single letter names, I or O or something like that, but this is way more explicit just for the purpose of the talk. Um, yeah, we have, our, we have our constructor that takes a predicate for the filter, and it takes a function for the map. And you can see that the mapping function takes both an in and out versus the predicate only takes an in. Um, all of this should be, pr n n nothing about this should be like, what? What's he doing so far? Um, and once again, we have a subscribe actual block, and we are just passing everything in. We'll handle the subscription and everything inside of the, uh, inside of the actual inner observer. Let's take a look at that inner observer, actually. So here's our skeleton. And we have, as you notice, a bunch more things going on. That's because we have to handle disposal from the upstream and the downstream. And we have to be sending, uh, we have to pass any disposal information downstream as well because we're in the middle and things could happen upstream. Maybe there's a take until right above us that we have to, that we have to pass down. Or maybe something's happening downstream that we have to propagate upstream. Uh, because we're in the middle, we have to handle both. Um, now, we take our observer instance as, I think here it's called child, but you could call it downstream, you could call it whatever. Um, and you note that we have on next. And that's, that's going to be the most interesting part of this, but we'll get to that in a second. All right, here's our, here's our unsubscribe block. Uh, this is handed to us by the observer interface that we implemented. And this is, as I said, slightly more complicated before because we have to handle disposal from both upstream and downstream. Uh, disposable, uh, disposable helper dot validate just allows us to atomically verify that we haven't received more than one disposable instance per subscription. Uh, if that happens, that's an error. Uh, and it's like, a, it's like an RxJava framework error. It's not like you did something wrong, unless you're like intentionally trying to screw with the subscription. But most people don't do that. They just want their code to work. Um, Essentially, what it does is it just validates that the, net, that the current parameter is null and the next parameter isn't null. And if that's not the case, it'll delegate an error to the, RX, an error to the RX Java plugins. It's just for making sure that the disposable uh, that we're taking over from the unsubscribe is, is actually the right one that we, that we should care about. All right, and for the rest of the methods, we're happy to just farm that out to the disposable instance that we just got. Um, if it's disposed, then we just tell the disposable instance, which is another you know, copy of the downstream, hey, by the way, you've been disposed. And uh, if someone needs to know if we've been disposed, we can just ask the downstream, I don't know, have we been disposed? 
Now we get to the um, observer code. This is on next, uh, on air, on complete, and we'll see on next in a moment. Um, nothing super crazy happening here. We're just, if there's an error from upstream, we pass it to the downstream. If there's a complete upstream, we pass it downstream. Uh, and fail uh, is a method that we'll use inside on next, but because the, the slides are only so long, I have to put it over here. Uh, it doesn't do anything that interesting, but basically if there's an insane in exception that occurs, like a stack overflow or a VM error or something like that, uh, that's not something that you should really be handling in your on error block. This is something that like should be handled at a, at a system layer. Um, and so throw if fatal will, will do that for you. You generally don't encounter this in the wild uh, unless you're, you know, unless something truly exceptional happens. Um, here's the on next block. Uh, it doesn't, once again, do anything that eye opening. We take a filter, we test the, we test the item that we're getting from the upstream. And if it passes our test, then we map it. Uh, true to RxJava2, we don't allow nulls anywhere. If we get a null, then we complain very loudly. Um, but when we, when we get our mapped value, then we just hand it to the downstream. So putting it all together, we have this completely production ready RxJava code that I didn't totally write in five minutes. Uh, we have our click observer, and that starts the stream. We have our custom filter map operator that we're, here we're using it with flat map. There's different ways to use custom operators depending on different interfaces that you might, um, th that you might override. Uh, if, you use the, um, if you use the observer interface or if you use any stuff that you've seen here, flat map is probably the best way. There's other things you can do if you look up the compose operators and the lift operators. Uh, those, are, those are different ways to include um, your, your custom code in as part of the stream. All right, now let's talk about not things that can go wrong, but things that, like nuance that should be part of the discussion. Um, now, in RxJava 1, observable.create was like, in big letters, a bad idea. It didn't, ha it didn't handle subscription well, it, did it didn't handle disposal well, um, and it was pretty easy for developers to shoot themselves in the foot. Um, so the, so the RxJava team decided, well, let's make it better so people don't shoot themselves in the foot. And they did. The, the disposal is a lot better, subscription is a lot better, uh, you don't have nearly as many bugs in the implementation, and there's not as much ways that things could go wrong because the emitter object that you're handed is not just a raw copy of the subscription object. And that, that, that solves a lot of problems. But there's still ways that we can hurt ourselves if we use it wrong. So let's say someone makes a pull request with this code. You're all experts now when it comes to making custom operators. So you know, you're the senior developer on the team. Someone gives you this pull request. Find the bug. There's a bug here. Yeah? Uh, on uh, the custom link, you don't say the, the listener to none. Yes, exactly right. Um, if you don't set the disposable to null, um, or it, it, basically, there's, there's, no, there's no listening for cancellation, so let's go back to the previous one. There's nothing listening for, hey, by the way, I'm done with the stream, you can null out the click listener. What's gonna happen is the, um, and okay, let me show you what you should do first and then I'll tell you what'll, what'll go wrong. So it's really simple, it's really subtle, we're not, setting, we're not setting a disposable on the emitter. And what this means is that the emitter has no way to know that someone from downstream needs to, needs to cancel the stream. It's so important and it's so subtle that I'm gonna bold it just to make sure everyone, everyone gets it. I'm really gonna drive this point home. There's no compiler warning, there's no lint for list, there's not, not even Rx lint handles this. You're just gonna ship a memory leak. Um, and it's, it's really, really subtle. Um, I actually, like, it took me a long time to figure out why my code had memory leaks in it and it's because I wasn't setting the disposable instance. Um, and you can see it's a really easy line of code. There's nothing really that exciting going on when the disposal happens. You set the click listener to null and you carry on your merry way. Uh, but if you notice, we handled this in our custom operator before, right? We had this, we had this disposable instance that we were, that we were getting and, we, and we, had to, we had to handle it because, our list, because we can't pass an instance of our listener to observer.onsubscribe unless it implements the disposable interface. It, the, you know, the observer demands that we handle this. Um, so now we have a decision to make, right? On one hand, 
we have a separate class with an inner, with an inner class inside of it that handles all this for us, like we saw in the, in the first few slides. And that's nice because handling the disposal is mandatory. You don't get a choice. There's not like, well, maybe if I remember to, maybe if the junior developers remember to. You do it, you're done, that's it. However, it's a lot of code. Even in Kotlin, it's gonna be a lot of code. And the new thing seems to be write as little code as humanly possible, so that's kind of a point against this. On the other hand, observable.create is literally three lines of code. You saw it, and it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's very easy. You could make it a static, you know, you could make it a static method and be on your way. It's very, very small. However, um, oh, one more, there we go. However, it's really easy to shoot yourself in the foot. All you have to do is have a bad day, maybe you're hungover, maybe you're not feeling well, you forget to write this line of code, and suddenly you have a memory leak. There's nothing to warn you. All you have to hope is that your fellow team members remember that you shouldn't ship memory leaks and they'll, they'll catch this mistake for you. Otherwise, it's out there. So I added this next slide because of the, uh, because of the, the panel that was there on RxJava. And so I just, I just wanna go over this really quick. I just wanna clear some misconceptions about RxJava. RxJava is one tool in your toolkit. Um, it's not an end-all be-all for everything. It is not a panacea to all of the problems you've ever had in your life. It's not going to fix your relationships. It's not gonna make your, you know, it's not, it's not gonna make you communicate better with your friends. It's not gonna, you know, wh whatever. It's not gonna fix your headache. It might cause more headaches, whatever. Um, it's, it's one tool in your toolkit, and that means that it has pointy edges that you might hurt yourself with, but that also means that you can do things with it that allow, that allow you to be more expressive with your code. So please don't, you know, when you're, when you're making your first custom operator, you're really excited about it, please don't put business logic inside of it. That's not what it's for. It makes your business logic truly untestable in a way that you never had even considered before. Even if you're putting all of your business logic in your activity, that's more testable than this. Um, I would recommend not putting, like just chaining a bunch of existing operators in a custom operator. I know we did an example of that, but that was instructive, not like you guys should definitely do this. Um, if you want to chain a bunch of operators, maybe you have a series of operators that happen a lot in your code, use transformers, observable transformer, single transformer. It's really, really useful. It's a very fluent way of adding new opera, adding like chunks of operators to different parts of your code. Dan Liu has a great blog post called Don't Break the Chain. Highly recommend it. It was actually one of the first ways that I started understanding the difference between transformers and other kinds of custom operators. The good thing to do, in my opinion, is really just use custom operators for bridging your non-RX code to your RX code. Whether you have a dialogue that you would like to under, you know, move to the RX world so you can chain your click listeners with your dialogues, with your network callbacks, with your blocking file IO. Like all of these things are things that are, are useful to, to move into the RX world so you can speak one language with all of them. Um, yeah, all right. Now this is, this is honestly just scratching the surface. Like this talk could have been four and a half hours um, there's plenty of things that I haven't talked about. I haven't even said the word operator inlining, which is one of the big features of RxJava 2 versus RxJava 1, in that you can, uh, the, the, the system has this ability to inline operators that it knows can be inlined. So if you call map four times in a row, it won't actually call four separate maps and do all the object creation. It'll just hand the result down to the next one. Uh, but you have to make your operator aware of how to do that. I haven't even talked about concurrency. I'm assuming that you're being a good citizen and not calling like on complete on a different thread that you're calling on next on. Um, obviously, it's not a good idea to call you know, different events on different threads. Uh, there's ways you can handle if you think that that might be happening, if you, if you think that maybe your um, just some, of the, some of the custom code that you're injecting in, like your, your maps or your filters, whatever, are, might be doing that. Uh, but once again, that's probably a whole separate talk unto itself. I haven't even talked about back pressure strategies, whether that's queue draining, whether that's request accounting, all the stuff that actually makes RxJava flowables like powerful and back pressure sensitive is a whole talk unto itself. It's like four blog posts worth of content. Speaking of blog posts, here are links uh, for everything. This is basically all of the knowledge that I use to make this, this presentation is right there. So if you wanna like cut out the middleman, 
here's, here's everything you need. Um, the Back Pressure series by David Carnock, who's one of the lead developers for Rx Java 2, is dense, I will admit, but it's very, very good and it helps understanding a lot of the internals of, of Rx Java 1 and Rx Java 2. Um, obviously, if you want some good code samples, Jake Wharton's Rx binding is probably like the best you're going to get, uh, besides my code samples, obviously. Um, they, uh, David Carnock has a whole series on how to write a custom operator. Some of it's targeted for RxJava 1, some of it's targeted for RxJava 2, but he goes into really wacky examples like how you deal with, um, with flat map, um, where you, you, know, you can subscribe to multiple things simultaneously and handle all of them in order. It, it's, it's mind blowing like the kind, of, the kind of things you have to account for with, with, that, with that sort of system. Uh, there's uh, one in four, there's another set of series on writing code for operator fusion. You would think that would be pretty simple. It's not simple. There's nothing with RxJava that's simple. Um, if you want the full code for the map filter hybrid, it's up there. And if you want the link to this presentation, that's there too. Finally, if you have any questions, you want to yell at me, you want to say that I did a great job, uh, that's my email. You can contact me and we can, we can chat. We can also chat now because hopefully I think we have time for a few questions. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I think the, the mics are probably live, so if you want to yep. go, go and yell at me from one of those yes. two mics. Two mics in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> I have the same problem. Uh, okay, so I'm not gonna yell. I'm just gonna say uh, thumbs up. Good, good talk. Thank you. Um, probably it's a lot, a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, one topic that I would have expected to be was like, you wrote the, I mean, that approach with writing a class um, for the operator. Then you showed how do you exactly integrate into the chain. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had that. Um, let's yeah. So that's that's the example right there. So you can see the click observable is just the first part of the stream. Uh, that that will start the stream, and I imagine that's ninety five percent of what you're going to need a custom operator for. But if you have some special use case, you want to write some crazy code, you can see line four there where we where we flat map is the other way to integrate a custom operator, especially if it's in the middle of a stream. Uh, there's other ways you can do it. You can use composable. You can use lift. Um, there's another there's another uh, interface that you can implement called operator observable operator. Um, single operator, all of these, and that is, uh, and for that you can use dispo uh, compose. Lift is used for transformer, I think, or I might have might have gotten those reversed. Mm -hmm. But there's there's a couple different ways to do it. So I don't have to use any uh, plugin registration and that kind of stuff. No, plugin registration is if you want to handle events outside of the typical lifecycle of, uh, of of an operator. So a lot of times, the like the, the main use case for plugin registration is I want to know when there's a crazy error that happens that hasn't been handled by an on error block, uh -huh. um, which is which is wholly separate from custom operators. From my, my understanding, maybe, maybe someone will email me and be like, what the hell are you talking about? That's not right at all. But from my understanding, plugin, like handling the plugin is, is just for exceptional things, not for like daily use. All right. Cool. Yeah, other questions? Yeah, so thanks for the talk. I have two questions. One, uh, uh, with Java, the like, operators are really needed. But with Kotlin, if you can write uh, your extension function to, like, if you, if you have this observable map filter, you can have an extension ma method that basically use map filter inside. So well, what would be, you know, is there a need for this kind of map filter operator uh, in uh, Kotlin? Um. So part one is that uh, it was, it, it's kind of, it was, it was a toy example. I think map plus filter is one of those, like, it's probably a good candidate for a transformer instead of a custom operator. Um, you could also use an extension function if you feel like going full 100% Kotlin. Um, I think there's, like, a, 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 an example of a custom operator that might be easier this way versus an extension function would be if you have very complicated retry logic that you'd like to integrate into your, like, into some streams, but not all of them. Um, 
yeah, there's, and then you can you, you can warehouse the logic so that you can reuse it for single, for completable, for uh, observable, mm -hmm. all of these. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't imagine that a lot of people are going to need to write intermediate custom operators that happen in the middle of the stream. Um, it's not a very common use case. A lot of people just need to take this thing that refuses to be reactive and move it kicking and screaming into the reactive world. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And the second question yeah. that uh, I need only yes, no question. Afterward, I will follow up with you. <laughs> Uh, have you ever implemented uh, uh, microfusion uh, uh, in your operator? Operator fusion? Uh, microfusion, not not macrofusion. Microfusion. Okay, um, we can take it. I, I don't, could you define that for me? Because I'm not. So, the uh, distinction is is unclear to me. Uh, macrofusion. Uh, macrofusion is, for example, you have like uh, observable f from iterable. So. Uh, if this is a real iterable with like many uh, items, it will do advanced logic. But if it checks that there's only one element, it will just observable dot just. Mm. So this is macro. In micro, what you said, like multiple map uh, things, and it merges to like one execution instead of like this passing, passing, passing to multiple. Right. Things. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the the common example is like using scalars versus you know doing the full mm -hmm. doing the full thing. I haven't. Um, it's a, a lot of the the custom operators that I've written have been uh, st like source of stream, mm -hmm. uh, and they, they they tend to be like not complex enough to like a lot of them are for single and stuff like that, and there's no there's no need to do scalar operators for single because like they're all scalar by default. Um, for observable, it hasn't really been a, a huge priority for me. Uh, that being said, that's probably like another talk unto itself is how to handle how to handle uh, deciding whether or not to send a you know a scalar versus versus a multiple multiple on next mm -hmm. um, David Carnock has a, a good series on that but once again he it can be a little difficult to, to <laughs> read his read his writing mm -hmm. yep. um, but yeah it, it, it is complex and that's one of the reasons I left it out of this because like that could be a whole other talk yeah thank you yeah That's it. No one, no one wants to get into a holy war discussion with me on RX Java, whether it's good, whether it's bad. No one wants to defend the panelists, being like, "No, they had it right. RX Java isn't good for us." I guess you're all here, so like I'm kind of preaching to the choir, probably. All right. Um, well, I think that's that's probably it. Uh, thank you guys for your time, and hopefully you can you can write some beautiful non-memory leaky custom operators, unlike me when I first started. Thank <laughs> you.